I really appreciate the opportunity that the elders have given me here this morning to be able to speak to you from God's word. It's always a blessing to be able to speak from God's word. And uh, I certainly am uh, encouraged by, by your willingness to get together in these type of times and, and to put the time into it to, to join together as we're called to do from that. One of the best times for me is I grew up and grew up in the church was always vacation Bible school. It only happened once a year and it was an important event in an otherwise open summer. One big part of that for me was always singing lots of children's songs, which was almost as good as snack time. Most of the time you just pretty much sang the song without thinking too much about what the words meant. Sure, you would follow some of the idea on the surface, but you really didn't think much beyond that. It's like the story told of the little boy who asked his father if he knew God's first name. His father replied, no. Being curious, he asked his son, what is his name? The son replied, Andy. Andy, the father replied. Yes, said the son. I learned it from mom's favorite hymn. Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy tells me I am his own. Well, one of the many songs that I remember from attending BBS was J-O-Y. The words to that song were very small. J-O-Y, J-O-Y. This is what it means. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. Now I could follow the idea of the order of the people. Jesus should be first in our lives. That's a basic lesson we learned from a very early age. And putting others ahead of ourselves, well, that was also fundamental. Though I would have to admit that as a young person, I didn't always find myself doing that. And in fact, if I'm totally honest, I don't always get that right in my life now. I'm not always putting other people first, but that's the goal. I understood the words of that song and I applied them as much as a child could be expected to do. But what I did not think much about was why did that spell joy? It may have been that the teacher or song leader tried to explain that relationship to me, but my young mind just did not have the ability to appreciate that association or did not accept it to the point that I retained that lesson. But I now appreciate it more than just being an acronym to trigger my memory of the relationships of people. That association between the order of the three people in this simple song and joy is what I want us to consider this morning. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus is asked by a scribe, what is the most important commandment? And he responds in verses 29 through 30. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Jesus' response was unquestionably correct and showed his wisdom as well as his ability to stymie those who looked to trap him. There was no denying that this positioning of God as first in one's life is the greatest commandment. And so the scribe could merely respond in the next verses in 32 through 34. And Jesus answered him after we, he said, the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one neighbors as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Now, the scribe likely had no true understanding of what was really meant in the commandment about God being one. He could not have been or would not have been so willing to credit Jesus' answer if he had understood it to include Jesus as well as the Holy Spirit in that God one. In John chapter 10, verse 24, Jesus was asked another question, that of whether he was the Christ. He summed up his response with six simple words that we find in verse 30. I and the Father are one. Jesus as God is first. We are to love no one or thing more than that of God. Again, that is something that we understand, even if we fail to fully implement it at all times in our lives. 
God was willing to offer his only begotten son for us. And that son was willing to be offered that we might have eternal life. But what's the connection between the putting of Jesus and God first to our having joy? Or is there any real claim that there is a connection there? At the Last Supper, Jesus made a strong effort to encourage his disciples, knowing the impact that his crucifixion would have upon them. As part of what he shared with them at that time were these words recorded in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, that were read to us earlier. But let's read them again. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus clearly makes the connection between love for him, his Father, and his commandments with joy. Joy that first came from Jesus, his joy might remain in them, and their own joy. That's not something that's just promised only to those who heard those words that night, but for all of us who put Jesus and God first. Sometimes that joy doesn't seem that joyful at the present time. Sometimes putting God first seems quite the opposite as we live here in this world. Peter made this point when he wrote his first epistle, using the words that we find in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Beloved, do not find, think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Putting Jesus first is not going to result in the prosperity gospel that some preach. So that's not the source of our joy. Peter says that trials are going to be experienced as part of partaking in Christ's sufferings. He tells his readers that being reproached for taking on Christ's names is a blessing, just as it is a way of glorifying him. Suffering as a Christian is something to use to glorify God, not to be ashamed of. When he returns, you will be glad with exceeding joy. How can you not be joyful when thinking about spending eternity with Jesus and God in heaven? There's no greater reward and nothing that we go through here on earth as far as suffering as Christians is significant when balanced against gaining that reward. But joy coming from trials is not limited to just knowing that your fate comes from judgment day. Nope. There are benefits to be counted on in the here and the now as well. James, the brother Jesus, told his readers about what comes from experiencing trials in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Trials bring positive outcomes. Testing of our faith is expected to, to produce patience, a trait that many of us, including me, have too little of at times. Patience is important in permitting us to live our lives as Jesus did his and how he expects us to live ours. Patience lets us plant the seed and water it, but leave the harvesting no matter how long it takes, or even if it ever comes, to God. Patience lets us continue to love one another, even when we inevitably have hurt feelings or outright anger. Patience is critical to our becoming as perfect and as complete as we can be as human beings. Patience 
is something to be joyful about. And it comes about not by just asking God for it. We can't get it by saying to God, give me patience and give it to me now. It is not instantaneous, nor easy to gain patience, but it's worth it. There's no question that putting Jesus first as our Savior and as God result in joy, both as we anticipate grasping the gift of spending eternity in heaven, and as we benefit from even the trials that come from being his follower. But it's the same true of putting ourselves last. No one greater than our Lord could set the example for us that we need to put ourselves last. None of us can come close to humbling ourselves to the point that the only Son of God did in coming to earth and being the sacrifice for our sins. Few have ever even knowingly given their lives for others. And when Jesus came to that point, what motivated his commitment to go through that process for us? The writer of Hebrews shares some powerful words to answer, words to answer that question in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us aside, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus the author and finisher of our faith endured the cross and its resulting shame so that he could sit down at the right hand of God's throne. He did it for the joy that was set before him. Where's the joy in the cross? The joy came from knowing what his sacrifice would do for us as sinful beings. He knew that for all that pain, that suffering and shame that he would endure, that it would result in the ultimate victory against death and against Satan. He knew that it provided the means, the pathway for our return to being in God's presence. He knew that it meant we could run our individual race with endurance because he had not only set the standard of being able to complete the race, but he guaranteed a winning result for those committed to running that race all the way through the completion of our lives here on earth. If he could put himself last, as he did so many times in his life, how can we question that putting ourselves last is more than what we can give? Paul was a tremendous man with a tremendous resume as far as being a Jew. He had much that he could brag about, and he reminded people of that when they thought too highly of themselves. He was a special messenger of God, which made him aware of things that could have been a discouragement to him, especially when they were bad for him personally. Yet he didn't value his life in comparison to doing God's will by his executing the ministry that he'd been given. In Acts chapter 20, he asked the elders of Ephesus to meet him in Miletus, knowing that it likely was the last opportunity for him to meet with them. Luke records in Acts 20, verses 20 through 22 through 24. And see, now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the God, grace of God. No matter the pleas that came from those that he encountered along his journey, nor the warnings that he'd been given, Paul was driven to finish his race with joy. He knew his earthly life was nothing, but the reward for finishing his race was everything. He was on a mission from God and was ready whenever God declared that mission to be complete. A man who suffered so much, so many times, was willing to go through more chains and tribulations if that was what was necessary for him to finish his race. It wasn't about him his comfort, his personal needs, or his wants, but about the reward that he knew awaited all those who finished their race. It wasn't about him at all. 
another New Testament character expressed much of that same sentiment. He was a man who had drawn crowds. He was a man who was the manifestation of Old Testament prophecy. He was a man given a tremendously important and unique mission ministry. Yet that ministry was never about him. He never gained anything from it. And when it was coming to a close and those near to him show, showed jealousy about the attention turning away from him, he made it clear that he had joy in that outcome. John shares with us this story of John the Baptist in John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing, and all are coming to him. Jesus answered and said, a man, or John rather, answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist didn't put himself ahead of anyone, let alone the Christ for whom he had prepared the way. He knew his role and did his utmost to execute it to the best of his ability. And Jesus, assuming his rightful place as the center of attention, was something he found fulfilled his own personal joy. It gave a great analogy of being a friend of the bridegroom, who rejoices when the bridegroom arrives, letting him take all the attention in the position of honor. There was no shame in John the Baptist decreasing, because his job was completed, and the embodiment of his message was there to deliver on that message. Being last was joyful. If these scriptures and examples haven't made the point clear enough, let Paul present it in no uncertain terms as we return to the example of Jesus. When he made the point to the church in Philippi that they needed to esteem others ahead of themselves, he made sure that they understood that in relationship to the example that Jesus had left for them as he wrote in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did it not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Paul later summarized that same thought in his first epistle to the church at Corinth when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own but each one, the other's well-being. Putting yourself last is what Jesus required of those who wanted to be great. That wasn't the way things worked in the rest of the world, but that's the way it works in God's kingdom. Matthew recorded the request of the mother of Zebedee's sons for them to be seated by his side in the kingdom in the response of the other 10 apostles. But most importantly, he documented Jesus' reply in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Ourselves last is a directive of Jesus required of those who desire greatness, which really just means that you want the reward. Joy comes not only from our expectation of that reward, but it comes from knowing that putting ourselves last contributes to helping others attain that same reward. 
just as Jesus went through suffering, shame, and death for us, knowing the joy that it would bring, we can know that putting ourselves last can contribute to others attaining that reward, which should only bring joy to us in the process. So what about that placement of others between Jesus and ourselves? For most of us, this is the most challenging part of the song's placement of people. Certainly, we understand the concept of putting ourselves last, and when we merely look at Jesus and ourselves, we have no problem with that order. But when it comes to actually putting others ahead of ourselves, well, that's where we begin to struggle at times. Paul didn't have that problem in his life. He knew the reward that awaited him when he completed his race, and he was desirous of it. Yet, he knew that his passing would not be in the best interest of other people. What could have been a dilemma for many of us had a clear outcome for him. He told the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 21 through 26, For me to live, or for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. His living on would unquestionably produce more fruit, more Christians, more faith in others. His dying will clearly be the most beneficial to him personally, but knowing, being confident that it was better for the Philippians and other Christians, for him to continue living and working brought him to an obvious conclusion. Undoubtedly, continuing his work would bring him joy, but more importantly, it would bring them the joy of faith. His possible visit would also cause them rejoicing as it would make them even more abundant in Jesus. This relates directly back to what we just discussed in putting ourselves last. We aren't last unless we place others ahead of ourselves. Just putting Jesus first, that doesn't do the trick. And even trying to do that means that we really didn't put him first if we are still putting ourselves ahead of others. The churches of Macedonia provided a great example of putting others ahead of themselves. They became an example that Paul used to motivate others to do the right thing, the same thing. He wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, Moreover, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Unquestionably, the faithfulness of others can also bring one great joy. The Macedonians found joy in giving even while in deep poverty. They were willing to give to their fellow Christians who had need and pressed Paul to take them up on their offer as soon as possible. This was driven by first giving themselves to the Lord and then to Paul and his group. Paul wanted all Christians to be motivated by love, with a common mission. Any realization of that vision was something that he saw as fulfilling his own joy. He desired that of the Philippians, and he was willing to do all he could do to help bring it to fruition. He writes in Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affliction and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. The righteous lives lived by others, whom one has a relationship with built around love, brings joy to us. The sharing of their faith and love, which results in refreshing the hearts of fellow Christians, brings about joy to the Christian, as Paul expressed about the life lived by Philemon in his letter written to him, in verses 4 through 7. I thank my God, 
making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Putting others ahead of ourselves and seeing others succeed in their running of the race is rewarding. John F. Kennedy once stated, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The Christian should find themselves being able to state, ask not what others can do for you or me, but what you or I can do for others. When you do things for others, when you sacrifice for their best interests, you will find yourself rewarded. You will find that joy. Meeting other people's needs brings joy. A volunteer servant is God's way, and it is rewarded here and in eternity. So what are we to conclude from our examination of that very short, and very simple children's song, J-O-Y? We have confirmed that there's truly a correlation between the positioning of Jesus first, ourselves last, and others in between that results in joy, our having joy. It isn't merely a handy mnemonic that helps us to remember to live our lives that way. Yes, it, it does remind us where we fall in relationship to God and others, but it also reminds us that in bringing about that order of relationships, we will have joy. Putting Jesus first Showing our love for God, Jesus and his commandments will bring us joy. Putting Jesus first, even when it is difficult, is driven by the joy set before us in knowing that our faith is glorious if we stay faithful. We know that the trials that we endure as Christians also benefit us by building our patience, which is necessary for our pursuit of perfection. There's joy in that as well. Putting ourselves last means mimicking Jesus' commitment to God's plan to bring about salvation, even when that plan required Jesus to undergo suffering, shame, and death at no fault of his own. Jesus did that for the joy set before him in seeing us reunited with God when we run the race with endurance. Putting ourselves last is mimicking the humility that was constantly on display in the life of Jesus as he lived here on earth. It is our willingness to be last that will mean not just our elevation to heaven, but hopefully the elevation of others to that same reward. Both should be joyful to the Christian. Putting others ahead of ourselves is hard for us as selfish human beings, but doing so is so tremendously rewarding. Paul was able to see that value and see that the value of his continued work on this earth to others was more important than his being able to finish his race and receive his reward. That could wait. Their joy was more important, and their joy brought him joy. The Macedonians' love for their fellow Christians, who they probably did not know personally, drove them to try and meet their needs, even when it required heavy sacrifices on their part. What an example of joy gain from putting others ahead of ourselves. And what great joy we can realize from the impact that others are having in the kingdom. Giving and serving others is a joyful commitment. The times we find ourselves currently living in make acting on God's invitation a bit more challenging. But the need is still there for us to always be in a right relationship with God. And I know that your elders stand ready to assist you in meeting any need that you might have. If you find yourself not putting Jesus first, not putting others ahead of yourself, then humble yourselves in prayer to God and ask for help from your brothers and sisters. Make it right where you are experiencing the complete joy of living in the Christian life. And if you're not a Christian, then you have no claim to that joy. But the offer is always open for you to place that claim and to realize the benefits of a Christian life. If you've heard God's word, believe that Jesus is the son of God, 
and are ready to confess him, repenting of your sinful life and being baptized, I know that can be done today. If you need assistance in any way, I encourage you to reach out to the elders so that they can help meet your needs. I know that they would like nothing more and it will bring joy to them as well as your other brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your time.